logic that says that incarceration is the answer. Land of the free, home of the slave, throw away the key, lock you in the cage, and it's been this way forever. like this. Y'all people treat your animals better. Politicians posing for pictures. He's trying to get a little press. But he don't know the struggle. He don't know the stress. Wait, I'm holding back. Tears, some don't have a chance. Caught up in a circumstance beyond our control. Where the outcomes is known. How you supposed to move? Where you supposed to go? Land of the free. Home of the slave. Throw away the key. Lock you in the cage. And Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are Impact Repertory Theater. Our name, Impact, is not just our name. It also stands for something. The I stands for? Inspiration. M. Motivation. P. Preparation. A. Activism. C. Commitment. And T. Teamwork. And we have something we believe in. Our credo is... We are youth activists who view the creative arts and leadership training as a way to develop ourselves and change the world in a positive way. We believe that we must be the message that we bring through hard work, focus, discipline, unity, and the principles of SOS. Safe space, outstanding effort, and service to our family, friends, and community. All right, and without further ado, Impact Repertory Theater. drive-by right now you living in the past we right now you living in a brand new site now change the world with the words we write down all i see is politics and when the street be politics it ain't safe we all at risk get money get power get a rest of our developing smarter kids and when the street be politics watch the street be politics make it move so we all exist get knowledge get power get justice or flip this corruption kids Time is critical, see beyond the visual. We are more than physical individuals, see the visible lie with the critical eye. One nation under God, we wear a disguise. The one to be recognized, one to be wise. Wisdom of a nation that is two time homicidal. Got survivors in American Idol, but I don't see activism on their autobio. I do. No politicians hate these losers are like puppets, dummies, and ventriloquists. Nah, I, nah, am P A C T. I'm Pinocchio. No strings in my me, Locchio. From the school of hard knocks and parochials, Piff ain't the allergen, all up in your bronchioles. Stand up, man up, pick your man up, get ready for a change, throw your hands up. Now politics on the street, same as the world. You'd rather kill for dollar, build destroying peace on earth. You'd rather build your client, tell a tell the truth we deserve. You'd rather treat your oil like crack the street work, we on yellow alert. But my mind sits where I turn it sand, say color as a sunrise jet. Is that really what oil's worth? Did that wait on my brother? While the government be fucking the world, we defend the propaganda while some get top bill. For getting innocent children, getting bombed in the dark That they forgot little children in ghettos to getting shots On the blocks, cribs and blood It's the same game mentality, let's give it these thugs now Now we can't change the world with a song But as we change the world, watch the world sing along Come on, all I see is politics And when the street be politics, it ain't safe We all at risk, get money, get power Get arrested for developing smarter kids And when the street be politics, watch the street be politics Now politics will get you 15 for feeding your family If you from where I'm from, I know How politics got my stomach ground Doing foul deeds late night When I'm out trying to find me a fiend Know what I look like, ask for handouts. handouts Especially when the crack in the gun says That's my man out I'm looking at my father like he's not a real man Like the family being broke wasn't part of the plan Ain't no justice in this world for us It's just us And when the revolution come, we recruit street soldiers So don't get in between Why? I'm something like a general going against the war of the machine Black Panther mixed with thug Call me the notorious hip hop Shakur. Ready to die when I'm rhyming it for, but all eyes on me every time that I talk. I'll never leave the government alone, my truth, until we all wear hoodies that are bulletproof. What? The 50 cent in their pocket got them dreaming of dollars, creating nightmares so the dreamers and cops multiply what Eminem showed the folks. Bitch, you spare with the rhythm and kill your opponents. It's a thin line between my mess and being homeless. Believe me, suit you fine, we ain't lost the moment. Dance, 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 do that dance, everybody, buddy. Do that. 
Uh, you looking for a job I right now. You living in the past we right now. You living in a brand new site now. Change the world with the words we politics. Let's have another round of applause for the Impact Repertory Theater. Awesome. Good evening, community. My name is Amanda, and I am one of three co-chairs for the Criminal Justice Caucus, along with Maggie and Joseph. We welcome you to our fifth annual Beyond the Bars conference. This conference was pioneered by the Criminal Justice Caucus at the Columbia School of Social Work. Students of the caucus began this conference with dreams of bringing individuals together in order to advocate for social change. The conference would not be what it is today without the dedication and support of administration, student body, and community members. As you might know, every year is specifically tailored to the current movement within the criminal justice realm. Due to the momentum of the current time, our theme this year is transforming injustice. <laughs> we have chosen this theme because right now, we are currently at a crucial standing point. Through the excruciating years of spreading awareness of mass incarceration and police brutality, we have gained incredible momentum coming out from our homes, from beyond our desks, and onto the streets with a driving force and dedication for justice and change. It is our continued hope that through events such as these, we keep this momentum going. We must never stop spreading awareness. We must never stop dreaming of a better tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Through continued collaboration and banding together, we can and will create a just society where we can be seen for more than just the color of our skin, but instead for our character. Continue with faith, continue with hope, and never give up. Good evening, everyone, and um, thank you all for coming. I'm Anibal Cortez, and I am a Beyond the Bars community fellow. Thank you. I'm, I'm part of the inaugural cohort of Beyond the Bars uh, fellows. And behind me you see a group of 25 men and women who come from diverse backgrounds, diverse interests, uh, ages, genders, uh, identifications. Some of us are formerly incarcerated, some of us have never been incarcerated. But one thing we do have in common is that we want to end mass incarceration. So who, who do the Beyond the Bars Fellows uh, stand with? So we stand with a number of, of organizations and people, some known and some not known. So 
uh, we stand with people who say black lives matter. That's right. We stand with those who want college back in prisons. We stand with those who want to release our aging prisoners. Reform parole policy. And we stand with those who want to ban the box and have been successful already. So, without, without further ado, this weekend we intend to dig deeper into the work of ending mass incarceration, building justice, and engaging in action beyond this weekend. So we thank you for coming, and on behalf of the Beyond the Bars Fellows, the Center for Justice, and the Criminal Justice Caucus, let us enjoy and get some work done. So we done. Wow, good evening, people. I'm loving this. My name is Cheryl Wilkins. I'm a part of the Center for Justice. And again, welcome to our fifth annual Beyond the Bars. Can you believe that? Fifth annual, Jeanette. <laughs> wow. I mean, there are a lot of people that helped uh, build this movement. I like that name, movement because we started out as an initiative, now we're a center. Now we're building a movement. And who's a part of that movement? All of us. All of us are part of this movement, and I'm loving it. And one person I just want to acknowledge, and she's not here tonight, and you know, we couldn't have did it without her, is Miss Angela Davis. Yes. She has supported us, I mean, from the very beginning, and here's to you, Angela. It's crowded tonight, Angela. <laughs> So I'm Geraldine Downey, I'm also from the Center for Justice and I'm delighted to see such a fantastic turnout here tonight. And I'm glad that we have become a center and I want to acknowledge the very generous support of the university and also of the Tau Foundation and the great news that we got today that the Mellon Foundation will be continuing to help us advance uh, our efforts, especially around uh, justice in education. And so this is really good news. So without further ado, let me introduce uh, our host for the evening, uh, Columbia's own, New York's own, and the world's own, Brian Bain, who... So he is returning to a sellout crowd, having uh, brought a sellout crowd to um, Miller Theatre for lyrics from lockdown back in uh, November. So Brian, come on. All right. Peace. Oh, come on. Peace. I think we can still do better than that. Where you at? When I say beyond, somebody say the bars beyond. Beyond. When I say transform, somebody say justice. Transform. Transform. Somebody scream. I think they just about ready, Kathy. <laughs> If you are happy to be here tonight, happy to be alive and in the world, building with this movement for transformative revolutionary change, make some noise in the house. That's what I'm talking about. 
When all is said and done, we know we are coming together because we know some things need to change. And that's what tonight is about. My name is Breon Bain, here all the way from Planet Brooklyn. Blessed to be with y'all tonight. Brooklyn! Yes, yes! So real quick, because I'm going to bring on our first powerful student speaker to come and bless us. But real quick, if you're with me, and you're not just about tinkering around the edges, but really about transformative, fundamental, revolutionary change, when I say rise up, I need you to say rise up, rise up, rise up. That's what I'm talking about. Rise up, black people, rise up. Rise up, brown people, rise up. Rise up, Latin people, rise up. Rise up, trans people, rise up. Rise up, working people, rise up. Rise up, everybody, rise up. Rise up, all my sisters, rise up. Rise up, everybody, rise up. Make some noise. Give yourselves a round of applause. I think we're ready. I think we're ready. Y'all looking so beautiful. Check, check, check. Don't bounce the check. All right, here we go. I think we're ready to go. So our first student speaker. What's up, Vivian? How you doing? TSC in the building, you know what I'm saying? All right, all right. So we have our first student coming to bless. How many Columbia students in the room? Make some noise. Okay. My condolences. I went to this fine institution myself. I'm still paying back the loans. So our first student is a poet organizer. All right. She's involved with Students Against Mass Incarceration. Make some noise if you're down with Students Against Mass Incarceration. She's down with Columbia Prison Divest Campaign on campus. Make some noise. The Black Youth Project 100. Make some noise if you're down for that. Just came back from Switzerland as a part of We Charge Genocide. Please put your hands together. Show your love like your mama's coming to the stage for Asha Rosa. Um, so thank you, Brian, for the um, introduction um, and to the organizers of the event. I'm really excited to be here. Um, there are a lot of you. Um, <laughs> uh, so as I was reading through um, kind of what the goals for this year's conference are, um, one of the questions was, how do we work for lasting transformative change? Um, and so that's kind of what I'm going to talk about. Um, but, but before I do, I want to back up. Uh, start by backing up a little bit and talking about the current moment that we're in um, and what transformative change actually means and what we mean when we say this word transformation. Um, so for myself and other young black people my age, um, I'm 20 years old, so this might be a little bit different for people even just a little bit older, um, but Trayvon Martin's death, the subsequent media narratives and trial came at a sort of coming of age moment. I had just turned 19 when the Zimmerman verdict came out, a moment in which I was figuring out my identity, my politics, and my place in the world. Fast forward a year to August 9th, 2014, um, which is the day that Michael Brown was, was killed in Ferguson, Missouri. Um, in the year between the Zimmerman verdict, um, which was also that summer was the 50th anniversary of the March, March on Washington, um, during the commemoration in D.C., all of the young uh, black organizers who were supposed to speak at the event were actually uh, kicked off the speaker lineup um, that day. Um, and we saw kind of a lot of disappointment within circles of young black organizers around the momentum um, that this verdict didn't spark. Um, so between then um, and last summer, uh, when Michael Brown died in Ferguson, um, young black people got organized. Um, and a lot of the groundwork was laid for us to be prepared to take hold um, of the moment that happened in Ferguson. And a more transformative agenda was able to be put forth after the events in Ferguson um, in a way that did not happen after uh, the verdict around Trayvon Martin. Um, and so I'll, I'll get into kind of why I think that is a little bit um, later. But so. Just to say a quote from um, Ella Baker uh, about what the word radical means and how that relates to this idea of transformation. 
Um, we are going to have to think, learn to think in radical terms. I use the word radical in its original meaning, getting down to and understanding the root cause. It means facing a system that does not lend itself to your needs and devising means by which you change that system. Um, and she said that in 1969. Um, and so thinking about what, what is a radical or transformative agenda around criminalization and incarceration in this country look like today, um, look like post Zimmerman verdict or post Ferguson. Um, it looks like one, um, the need to dispel the myth that the role of the police is to keep people safe. Um, I'll, <laughs> word. Although they do keep some people safe. Um, so for me, in my vision of community safety, people with guns in a position of power and impunity are not an element of that. Um, and so even though police do keep some people safe, people with property, privilege, white skin, sometimes a Columbia University ID, it's important to understand that the protection of specific classes of people happens in a context where, there, where the majority of arrests that police in U.S. cities make are for nonviolent misdemeanor offenses. Um, and those, uh, those arrests happen with discriminatory and targeted enforcement. What this tells us is that the primary function of the system of policing we have today is to control people. It's not to keep people with safe. Um, and, and we see that some people are kept safe, but the primary function of this system really is to control people. Um, it's not the other way around. Controlling people is not a product of keeping other people safe, um, but that, that this primary function is about control. And we see that. Um, this system has been built on, on a legacy um, of policing black bodies in this country, going back all the way to slavery, to post-reconstruction, to slave codes, laws that made it illegal for black people to do fundamentally anything. Um, and so that leads me to the next thing I want to say, which is about um, the conversations we have about violence. Um, we need to be shifting them toward a framework of analyzing structural violence. Um, and so when we talk, when we look at the difference between the moments of Trayvon Martin's death and Michael Brown, um, we can kind of analyze how this works out there. Um, and so when we see young black people dying at the hands of the police, as we do all too frequently today, um, there's, there's often a conversation about, oh, well, well, was this person really innocent? Were they doing something wrong? Um, and that's problematic for a number of reasons. Um, regardless of whether or not someone should be doing something wrong, no one deserves uh, to die the way black people are at the hands of the police. Um, but, but connecting this issue of police violence to, to also incarceration and what we consider crimes, um, this conversation around innocence really is irrelevant. That c crime is socially constructed um, and law enforcement practices mean that these laws are enforced on certain bodies and not on others. Um, and that in this country, the idea of criminality has been constructed in tandem um, with the oppression of black people. Um, and it, it may no longer be socially acceptable in most circles um, to be anti-black, but it is acceptable to be anti-criminal. Um, and so, yeah, so this idea of innocence, like, that's irrelevant. We should not be, ha we should not, somebody gets killed by the police, we should not be, like, talking about whether they got straight A's or what they did wrong. We should t be talking about state violence. And so, so what I saw happen when I was organizing with other young black people after Trayvon Martin and then now after the events we saw in Ferguson, Following the murder of Mike Brown at the hands of Darren Wilson, we were required to connect his death to the repressive policing of protests we saw in Ferguson, um, and that's what led to this structural argument around the organizing that's going on. Um, we weren't allowed to talk about good cops and bad cops because we were both seeing interpersonal violence between Mike Brown and Darren Wilson, and then the response when you see the National Guard coming in, when you see all the state police um, just having been in Ferguson, like. Ocu police occupation um, just to defend this kind of structure where black bodies are viable um, 
and that the police are sanctioned by the state to commit violence. And so we saw a shift from the crux of the argument being the innocence of Trayvon Martin to the crux of the argument being the violence of the state. Um, and people felt the need for a more transformative agenda there, one in which we are now cr critiquing the fundamental role of police and prisons in our society. Um, so I believe in the abolition of police and prisons. Um, because I... Word. Because, because I don't think punishment is effective, um, especially within the racist structures that are built on the history that, that we have in this country. Um, so when I, when I talk about prison abolition, I always feel the need to um, credit one of my mentors from Chicago, Miriam Kaba, um, for the ideas that I say. Um, but so in, in a world where calling the police is the go-to solution for solving problems, um, it's really hard, even for myself and people who hold the politics that I hold, to actually imagine what prison abolition or police abolition can look like. Um, even if we believe we don't believe in punishment and we believe in caring for people, um, thinking about what transformative justice um, or prison abolition actually looks like is really hard. Um, but in a world where calling the police is that go-to solution for solving problems, um, and I don't think the argument needs to be made again as to why that is not a practice that gets at the root of problems, um, like Ella Baker su suggests we should. Every time you don't call the police and you figure out a different way of solving a problem, you are working toward prison abolition. Uh, and I credit that idea to Miriam Kaba uh, and what she has taught me. Um, we need, and we need to only be supporting policies and initiatives that take power away from these systems um, because they have too much. And so this is where you get at this idea of reform pending revolution um, or reform pending transformation. Um, and that being we should be working to make people's lives easier in the meantime um, and not be uh, so idealistic about our politics um, that we cannot move. However, we shouldn't be um, looking for short-term solutions that actually bolster the, the systems that we're critiquing. One example that folks are organizing around, civilian elected police accountability councils. Um, so taking the, the power away from the police to be the only people that can check themselves um, and creating some separate body. Um, one example that we saw recently of something that was not a reform pending revolution is this idea of body cameras. Um, and what you saw right away when um, body cameras were being, being talked about right after Ferguson, um, Obama launched this uh, kind of pilot program of them in Chicago, and you saw a lot of organizers at the forefront of this Black Lives Matter moment supporting um, this initiative, and very quickly there was an oh wait moment um, where folks realized that body cameras actually were just giving more money and more power um, to a system that to the system that we were that we were critiquing, um, where police still have the ability to control what is what is um, what is seen and how footage is used, um, and how you, we're then delegitimizing the people's the people's cameras, right? Other forms of documenting what the police are doing, um, and that the more tools and gadgets you put um, on the the belt or the body of a cop, the more control and power we give to police officers and legitimacy we give to the institution of policing. Um, and we therefore further legitimize the increasing culture of punishment that many of us live in. Um, word. So I'm an organizer. Um, the last kind of thing that I just want to say while I'm up here um, is about solid is about organizing, um, and within that solidarity, um, and also kind of the damage that a universalist discourse can do within our movements. Um, so I believe that it's important to organize, I believe it's important to be in organizations, um, and I think it's equally important how we organize. Um, and what that means is centering the most marginal, centering the voices of the people who are most marginalized, not only in society, but within our movements. Um, and so that means black folks, that means queer, tra queer and trans black folks, that means women and girls, um, that means folks who are differently abled, folks with different immigration status. Um, and, and, you know, I think that that sounds kind of implied, but right in the, especially in New York City in these Black Lives Matter protests, um, what we heard a lot of was there would be like a group of young black people like really hype, 
chanting Black Lives Matter, like feeling themselves in a way that black people don't often get to feel themselves. Um, and then that would start to get drowned out um, by, this, by this other slogan, All Lives Matter. Um, and I'm going to explain why I think that's a problem. Um, it's not that all, and there was pushback, right? So it's not that all lives don't matter. Um, but the point being, the point of Black Lives Matter is that we don't get to say that. Um, it is, even within movement spaces, hard and people have to fight for the space to say that Black Lives Matter. We don't have to do the same for all lives. Um, and that by saying Black Lives Matter, we're actually doing something that is threatening um, this kind of universalist discourse that American democracy is able to rest on um, and that with, with that discourse we're able to hide um, the inequality that actually exists, um, right? So the, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence said all lives matter um, and we all know who wrote that and what happened after. Um, So yeah, um, the last thing I'll say um, is really just, I haven't lived a, lo a very long time, um, 20 years, and I haven't been a grown person for much of that time. Um, so I haven't seen a lot of movements, but I do know that what we are in right now, um, when we saw, or maybe we're a part of, bridges and highways being shut down all over New York City and the country for weeks, when we saw 60,000 people marching in, in the streets in Manhattan, when we see Black Lives Matter trending on Twitter, um, that we are in a moment, and it's up to us, the people committed to building a more just world, whether it turns into a movement. Um, and so I have no hesitation that there are enough people committed to this moment. But I believe that whether it will be sustained and successful is, de is dependent on how committed we are to people. Um, and that means being more committed to people and to building a movement that functions in a way that is reflective of its politics um, than we are to abstract political agendas. Um, that being in solidarity with um, the slogan or the hashtag Black Lives Matter is not simply in alignment um, with an agenda or an abstract politics, but it's about a willingness to acknowledge the everyday lived experience of being black in this country, um, and it's a commitment more than anything uh, to people. So, that's all I'm going to say. One more time, make some noise for Asha Rosa, y'all. Can we give it up for the Beyond the Bars fellows? Can we give it up for them one time? Worked so hard to put this together. If you have your smartphone, I want you to actually go, you can hit up, make sure you get this down. Hashtag Beyond the Bars 2015 and hashtag Transforming Injustice. You should also follow me on Twitter, Brian Bain. Uh, I want to uh, do something. How many folks were here last year? Okay. So, so you uh, got to enjoy uh, some of what we did. I just I was asked to bring back something we did last year, and you know I saw Angela getting all into it. Like, oh, I was like, okay, that's that's a keeper. All right. So, so we're gonna do this little thing to call on the strength of our ancestors to actually give us the energy we need to do this very serious, important work. Okay. So, uh, as some of y'all know, the story goes. You know, the my barber said to me one time. He said, the uh, you know, Brian, you always talk about how the early bird gets the worm, but never how the second mouse gets the Cheese. And I was like, what are you smoking talking about the second mouse? He said, no, listen, no. The first mouse comes along, goes down, and what happens? <coughs> Neck all broke up in a trap. Second mouse comes along, says, oh, it sucks to be you. <laughs> but, but I got mine, right? So all of us are like the second mouse because all of us are here because somebody else put their neck on the line for us to be here. Are you with me? Are you with me? Okay. So this is how this goes. If this is the liveest side of the room over here, make some noise. 
If y'all don't know what the hell they talking about, because y'all the live inside of the room, y'all make some noise over here. Up top, where you at? So here we go. When I say, I know they watching, I need y'all to say, ancestors watching. I know they watching. When I say, I know they watching, y'all to say, I know, I know, I know they watching. That was just lazy. Not even like the remedial class. They're not even, you know, I'm not into track and all that, but y'all would get tracked, all right? So you got to pick it up. You got to pick it up. More energy, all right? Like your life depends on it because it does. Here we go. All the ancestors, everybody who's lost someone, all right? All right. If you have no ancestors, you can be quiet. Here we go. I know they watching, ancestors watching, I know they watching, I know, I know, come on, I know they watching, ancestors watching, I know they watching, I know, come on, I know they watching, I know they watching, little louder, I know they watching, ancestors watching, I know they watching, I know, I know, well, all right, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, give yourself a round of applause, not bad, not bad, I think we can take it just a little notch higher, all right? If you have, if, if rhythm ain't no friend of yours, you can look to the left or right, find the one, and put it down. <laughs> I'm just going to throw it at you, and you're not going to know when it's coming. All right, this is important because we're getting ready to honor one of our esteemed ancestors who recently passed, brother who meant the world to me and to many of us in this movement, worked 25 years incarcerated for crime he didn't commit, and has been an inspiration to, to all of us doing this work for over a decade. So, uh, so I want y'all to bring it this time. I'm not going to warn you. I'm just going to throw it at you see who's really focused and paying attention, all right? It's just going to creep up on you. The world ain't the way it's supposed to be, but I know they watching over me. Trouble keep coming close to me, but I know they watching over me. I know they watching. I know they're watching, I know, I know, I know they're watching, ancestors watching, I know they're watching, I know, come on, I know they're watching, ancestors watching, I know they're watching, I know, one more, I know they're watching, ancestors watching, I know they're watching, I know, I know, give yourselves a big round of applause. Coming to the stage, this next brother, only... The words of Malcolm X are appropriate for bringing him to the stage. He is a longtime activist, executive director of the Center for New Leadership on Urban Solutions, the world's first research think tank run, founded by formerly, formerly incarcerated professionals right in central Brooklyn. He is a social scientist with experience consulting everybody from community organizations to police officers to judges. This brother is, 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 so committed and so dedicated, works so hard. I don't know how he found that 25th hour every day, but he does it to make this work happen. He is a, a, a true leader in our communities, and it's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure to call him my friend. He reminds me of Malcolm's words. Malcolm said, we as a people have for so long done so much with so little that we are now qualified to do anything with nothing. Please put your hands together for Dr. Divine Pryor. Good evening. What's up? What's happening? Peace, assalamu alaikum, and all of the greetings that are appropriate. Uh, let me first take this opportunity for, to thank all of the organizers of the Beyond the Bars conference. Let's give them a round of applause in advance. I was told that I have three minutes. And so let me pull out my cell phone so that I can keep myself honest. So you already know my name. I'm here to give tribute uh, to the man that we all know as Eddie Edwin Ellis. Eddie Ellis was a visionary. He was certainly a man before his time. Rather than me stand up here and talk about all the things that Eddie did, let me talk about what Eddie stood for. But you have to remember that Eddie spoke a lot in parable. And as most of us who had grandparents, they never talk straight, they spoke in parable. So Eddie had a lot of parables. And I know that uh, of the many parables that Eddie said to me, he said, Divine, the last person that's going to discover water is going to be a fish. 
Now, I want you to think on that for a moment as I speak about our beloved brother, Eddie Ellis, and I'm not going to tell you what it means until the end. I want you to ponder on it. But what I will say is this. Fifteen years ago, Eddie Ellis called me at 3 o'clock in the morning. Fifteen years ago, we were not formerly incarcerated people. Fifteen years ago, we were ex-convicts. We were inmates. We were offenders. We were parasites. We were violent predators. But we were not people. We were the subject of someone else's scorn. We were people who had been pushed out, locked out, and shut out and forgotten. We were a population who had no voice. Eddie said it's time for us to have a voice. I remember his voice as if it was last night. He said, Devon, I think we hit the golden grail. And what he was talking about was organizing a population that did not have a voice, that did not have a place, that did not have a seat at the table. He said that it was time for us to not only fill the void, but it's time for us to raise the bar. That it was time for us to represent ourselves. It was time for us to speak for ourselves. It was time for us to take a stand because he said, as someone said before him, that anyone who didn't stand for something would go for anything. And we decided that we would not do that, that instead that we would be trailblazers, instead that we would open up the way. We made a decision, a conscious decision, to make a sacrifice. And that sacrifice was for us to create a critical mass. Eddie was very vigilant in that he wanted us to open up the airwaves. He wanted us to create an environment where leadership could emerge. It wasn't about him. It wasn't about us, but it was about all of us. It was about everyone finding their voice, finding their purpose, and being able to understand that all of us have a reason and a cause that we have to fulfill. Now, I don't know about you, but each and every one of us is going to go on one day. And Eddie said to me, all you get is a hyphen. Now, the hyphen is that little indentation between the date you were born and the date that you leave here. Eddie said that all of us are going to have a 45-minute service. Some people are going to be crying, a whole lot of people lying. He said, but the only thing that you're going to have is what you did with your hyphen. Did you do something meaningful? Did you do something significant? Did you do something with purpose? Did you build something? Did you grow something? Did you do something that someone 100 years from now could be inspired by? Because if you did not do that, then your existence was null and void. I'm down to my last minute. <laughs> I better make it count. Eddie is the founder of the Center for New Leadership on Urban Solutions, the world's first and still the world's only criminal justice, public policy, research, advocacy, and training center run from the top to the bottom by formerly incarcerated professionals representing every discipline from law to medicine. But it's not just the center that Eddie founded, it was the sentiment in the center. And what Eddie said that we could spend all of our time criticizing the system. We could spend all of our time pointing out who did what, when, and how. He said, but he borrowed from the words of Malcolm, and Malcolm said, rather than talk about the dirty glass, just sit a clean glass next to it. So ladies and gentlemen, Eddie Ellis walked around with a clean glass. And he sat the clean glass there for us to be the change that we wanted to see. That we had to stand up and we had to represent the ideals that we put forth. So when we created our theory for change, the human justice theory, a formula which is human rights plus human development equals human justice, this is not just rhetorical. But this is about protecting the very essence of who we are. This was about lending your life to a cause that's worth dying for because anyone who doesn't have anything worth dying for doesn't have anything worth living for. So in my last 30 seconds, let me say that Eddie Ellis is looking down on us, and I'm sure he's proud. 
He's proud of what's happening here at Columbia. He's proud of what's happening in the Carolinas. He's proud of what's happening in Texas. You have formerly incarcerated people now who are doctors, who are lawyers, who are preachers, who are nurses, who are social workers, who are leading change, who are transforming the world, and I'm happy to be a part of that change. So to follow behind my man, Breon Bain, let me say that we as a people have done so much for so long with so little that we are now qualified to do anything with nothing. So always shoot for the moon, because Eddie said, even if you miss, you'll still at least be amongst the stars. Thank you so much. So, ah, she said, what about the fish? You know, the fish is born in water. The fish swims in water, it eats the water, surrounded by the water, it only knows the water. So when you say to the fish that the water's wet, the fish doesn't know what you're talking about because it doesn't have a reference point. There are some folks who have born in privilege and entitlement. And they don't know that it's privilege and entitlement. They have to be made to know. We have to get them out the water. We have to find a way for them to survive once they get out the water. And so that is the analogy of the fish and water. I'll let you ponder on the rest. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing a friend and a colleague, a man who is a leader in and of himself, who hit the ground running, who demonstrates tenacity, who's an intellectual giant, and he's still rather young. He hasn't even touched his peak, but yet he's already blazing the trail, and he's already set an example for many of us to follow. So without further ado, let me introduce my friend, my colleague, Brother Marlon Peterson. Thank you, thank you, Devon. Now, when we had this prep, we said Devon had three minutes. The Reverend Dr. Devon Pryor, three minutes. We see how that went. <laughs> I stand here before you today, 50 years after Selma, 50 years after Malcolm, three days after a scathing Department of Justice report that spoke of the atrocities in Ferguson. I stand before you today between two eddies, one Eddie, Brother Eddie Ellis, whom I met while I was in prison through radio, On The Count. Anyone here ever listen to On The Count? And I, who spent 25 years in prison for trumped up charges. And I stand before another Eddie, Eddie Conway, whom you'll meet in a few minutes, who spent 44 years in prison for trumped up charges. Both leaders in their own right. Both freedom fighters in their own right. It is their legacy that I stand before you today as an extension of it. You see, my legacy, the legacy of folks like myself in this audience and beyond in the bar still are an extension of what those folks have been able to do for us today. You see, my legacy, which is still happening, was matured in the same place that their own was, where Brother Malcolm own was, which is behind those prison bars, 10 years in the making. But you see, as I honor them and their legacies, I see this transformational work that we do through an intersectional, through an intersectional lens, through a lens that is, through a lens that is, that is intersectional and, and transformational because as I do the work with working with young people in Brownsville or I'm implementing programs within the city to, to, to eradicate gun violence in our communities, as I'm walking around these streets shouting out Black Lives Matter in, in protests and in direct, direct actions around this city, this is something I do understand. This is something that we should all understand. This work, when we think about intersectionality of this work, we can't do this work without thinking about the folks who are gay in this work, the folks who are transgender in this work, the folks who are being deported. You see, these folks are the same folks that are harmed by police violence. These are the same folks that's victimized by mass incarceration, mass deportation, mass criminalization. Our link our legacies are undoubtedly connected to transformational justice, the people work, as I like to call it. You know, just a couple months ago, a good friend of mine, he's in the audience here, Khalil, um, he was released from deportation proceedings. Something that rarely ever happens. Let me be clear to you, when you have that final order of deportation, it rarely happens where you get to come home. 
And the day he was released, I left work immediately with a colleague and ran down to meet him and his wife uh, at a restaurant that we just had lunch at earlier today called P.O.P.O. P. O. No. And they're not paying me for that. Um, and on the way there, the colleague who I went to see Kalova said to me, uh, well, let me back up a little bit really quick. I said, this never happens. I was sort of dumbfounded. I was still struck that he was actually released because we didn't expect it to happen. And this colleague said to me, Molly, you should expect this. We do this work to win. We need to understand. We need to perceive. We need to see. We need to envision what victory looks like. And as, as simple as that may sound, it was profound to me, and it should be profound to you. Because we have to envision what this victory looks like. We have to be able to see what the top of the white supremacy looks like. We have to understand when we see Black Lives Matter, we have to believe and see what Black Lives Matter looks like when it really does. We have to be able to see that this work that we do here should not be dictated by funders that gives us contracts. When we, when we do this work and when we do our vision boards for this work, we got to make sure that we don't re redesign the same oppression that has their, necks on our, on, or has their foot on our necks. You see, the Department of Justice report, and I'm minding up to bring the next person on, the Department of Justice report told us something very important, that the position that we're in is strategically intended. It's no mistake. And as we do this work, we have to be able to envision it so that we make no mistakes about our work, about what we want to see, how we want justice to look like, what transformational justice actually looks like. So as we do this work of collective freedom and justice, I'm going to wind down, but I got to summon in, and I need some of your support, but I'm going to summon in my sister, our sister, Asada Shakur. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Now, I'm actually repeat this to me. Repeat this after me. I believe that we will win. 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 I ain't hearing that. Breon, you need a mic? I believe that we will win. 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 So let me bring on this brother, this other Eddie, Eddie Conway, as I mentioned. He's a freedom fighter himself in his own right who astounded me with his own story, who spent 45, 44 years in prison uh, for charges. Uh, uh, and he was also a member, a leading member of the Baltimore Black Panther Party, similar to Eddie Ellis here in Harlem. So without further ado, I want to introduce Brother Eddie Conway to the stage. Come on, Eddie Conway. Brother Eddie said to me, Marlon, you got a tie on. I got on a shirt. What's happening? <laughs> so Eddie, Eddie Conway, so, you know, he spent 44 years in, uh, in prison for a crime for which you maintain innocence, for which you did not do. Um, and in this conversation, I wanted to sort of frame for the audience around leadership particularly. Now, you went in when you were 24. Um, recently, as I mentioned just three days ago, the Department of Justice report came out that mentioned the scathing sort of, not the atrocities of the not only police, but the justice system, the judicial branch, the legislative branch which in, within Ferguson, um, which to me was similar to the 1976 report that unmasked COINTELPRO. So kind of like putting those two things together, juxtaposing those two, um, you had the civil rights movement, you had boycotts, today we got Black Lives Matter, two million people in prison, over two million people deported within the last seven and a half, six and a half years. What is your analysis on the state of leadership today? Well, well, first, I, I think it's important, like those justice reports, uh, they have been uh, bringing those reports out for the last couple hundred years. Uh, they have been coming up with the same findings, whether it was on COINTELPRO or, or whatever it was. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, every 28 hours, on average, a black man, woman, or child is killed by some kind of enforcement agency, whether in the prison system or whether security guards or whether uniform officers. That's a fact, and that hasn't stopped since slavery. 
and that will continue until we find a way to gain control of the people that's patrolling our community. And that's why the Black Panther Party started. What I think about the leadership today is I think young people is going to get it right. I think they're working it out. I can remember, and I think I mentioned this to you back in 1963, 64. I was in Europe, but I watched what was going on in America. And young people in America was trying to figure out, beyond the civil rights movement, how to organize. And you had the free speech movement. You had the anti-war movement. You had the cultural nationalist movement. You had all kinds of movements sprung up, SCS, et cetera. And eventually, it grew into the Black Panther Party. It grew into uh, the American Indian Movement. It grew into uh, all other kinds of organizations that took a firmer stance. Today, young people are searching for a solution to how to change the conditions, to change the structure. They'll come up with it. It might take another year. I think they're committed. They're just starting. And I think, and this is something that I tell my comrades and other people of my generation is let them figure it out, let them decide how they're going to organize and let them create their own structures because 50 years ago when we started, we didn't listen to anybody. <laughs> In fact, our attitude was that uh, well, in, in if you're fact, over 30, in, in, right, that's what I was about to bring up. Don't trust them. You know, we didn't trust people over 30 back then in the 60s and the 70s. I mean, of course, we worked with some people that were more progressive and more advanced and whatnot. But in general, we had an attitude that we needed to figure out what was going on. We thought, you know, we could decide how we was going to sacrifice our lives if we did. And I think young people today have to make that same decision. You know, uh, thank you for that. As, 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 you know, as you mentioned, young people, you know, today, you know, we have so many people all over this, over this country, particularly around um, recent uh, issues with police accountability, the most recent issues with police economy, ac accountability. So you have people all over the country like, you know, I can mention, mention some names, Opal Tometi and Janetta Elzey, and then you have people like uh, Michelle Alexander here today and Dr. Devine Pry and Glenn Martin. Like, there's so many people today that we have, but they are folks today even of our older of our elder eldership i don't know if that's the word who feel as such that many younger folks just sort of sit back and watch and some of those folks are based right here in harlem and i could be very explicit in terms of the reason why i wanted to bring this conversation up here was folks like brother al and other folks who feel like young folks need to just sort of sit back and and learn from the leaders um whether the critique is right or wrong i want to know your thoughts about that as somebody who can sort of bridges between both generations yeah, I, I think you can learn, you can read, you can study history, but I think you have to make those decisions yourself. I don't think you should be leading or, or listening to leadership that's past their time. Uh, and um, In addition, I don't think that young people should be trying to use the same apparatus as we use. The apparatus as we use worked then but failed as COINTELPRO and other agencies took advantage of their structure, their hierarchical structure, and, and turned us against each other. Young people need to figure out how to create networks and alliances and allegiance and, and not big leaders. And they need to let that leadership flow around, you know. Um, so, you know, they got to learn from their own experience. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as a, I'm here, I'm one of those people, I'm, I'm slightly over 30, so I don't know if folks under 30 here might, if I'm distrustful. Um, <laughs> um, but as somebody who, who spent more time in prison than I've spent on this earth, um, and we think about leadership as being intergenerational, because ultimately we need intergenerational sort of camaraderie to sort of deal with this monstrosity of mass criminalization, mass incarceration. Um, if your 24-year-old self, if you could think back to being 24 years old, and if you can sort of, and I'm asking this question in two parts. Think about it as a 24-year-old young man and as now as a person who's uh, much more mature in age and probably uh, definitely an insight. What is your analysis on leadership today? 
And I want you to think about it as a 24 year old person first. Well, okay, as, as, as a 24 year old, I think that we did the best we could. Oh, wait, wait, I want you to sort of look at it as from the, in the 2015 though. I want you to critique 2015 as a 24 year old. Well, if I, well, if I could be a, a 24 year old a day. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, no, I'm, I'm looking at, and I go around the country and I speak, and I've been speaking in California, I've speaken in South America, uh, up and down the uh, East Coast, uh, across the country. And the one thing that I've noticed is that there's a tremendous amount of young people that are starting to take note that there's some kind of systemic structural problem with America, with the economic system and with the, the relationship of its people. And it's kind of like trying to divide and conquer. Those people are starting to ask questions. Those people are starting to organize. I can't identify, and, I, and, and, and some of those names you bring up is good. I can't identify any particular leaders because it seems like they're organizing in groups and they pass that leadership around. I think that's good. I really honestly think that's the way to go. And I think, and just to go back for a minute, uh, you know, elders can give advice you know, they can share whatever experiences they have. They can be the example from whatever lives they, they live and how they present themselves. But ultimately, they have to be behind what young people do. They have to be supportive of what's happening. Because if this is going to turn from a minute to a movement, then it's going to turn because all of us are going to get on board, but we can't get on board as elders in the leadership. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> lastly, lastly, so as we, you sort of highlighted the, what, what some of the, our more mature older folks should be doing, I need you to also give us a, a critical, or give us critique of what young people can be doing better. I think we need to go well, both ways. Well, okay, and uh, I'm, I'm going to go against what I just said, but I'm <laughs> <laughs> I, I am going to say this because from being in prison for 44 years, the one thing that I noticed is like 25% of the world's prison population is held here in America, uh, which only has 5% of the world's population. And those prisoners inside are isolated and they are dehumanized by the lack of contact with their families, with their friends, and so on. So one of the things that can happen is people need to reach in. There's two and a half million people in there, but it's always transforming. People are coming in, people are going out. So a lot more people are being impacted. People need to reach in the prison systems. People need to start going in those prison systems. People should start shedding some light on those prison systems because most of those people, 90% of the people in the prison system are going to come back to the community. And they need to come back in a transformative way in which is uh, positive for the community. That's only going to happen if you get in there and you start working. But, and, and not to overdo this, but one of the things that, that needs to happen is we need to get back down in the community and build the community again. And we don't need no funds. We just need people. We need to get in there and we need to do things that's going to strengthen the community. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Please give a round of applause for Mr. Eddie Connolly. Thank you, Eddie. Again, give it up, give it up, give it up for Eddie and Marlon. One more time, y'all. Come on. Are y'all enjoying yourselves tonight? Are you enjoying yourself tonight? How many folks feel like they're in church? Can I get an amen? Can I get a hallelujah? All right. Holla. All right. So, uh... On your way out, please give to the building fund. Uh, <laughs>
There actually is no building fund, but we do have <laughs> Beyond the Bars fellows who have baskets on the way out, and you are more than welcome to give your tithe and offering to support the work. So <laughs> it's a real blessing. Are y'all ready for, see, when I first started writing this new Jim Crow book, right, um, <laughs> I had a lot of help, so I'm going to bring out some, uh, <laughs> please give a very warm welcome to the folks who are going to bring out our keynote speaker for this evening, Jazz Hayden, Dr. Barbara Wallace, and Dr. Kathy Boudin. Please put your hands together. Hello, everybody. My name is Kathy Boudin, and I work with the Center for Justice. And <clears throat> and before I introduce, before I go into my brief introduction, I just want to acknowledge that Senator Velma Nett Montgomery is here tonight. She's one of the people who has worked tirelessly in the State Assembly. Senator Montgomery, if you could stand up for a minute, as she is. So I want to just say that we're really honored, of course, to have Michelle Alexander here, and I'm trying to think about what to say. I think that part of what is so inspiring and so moving about Michelle Alexander is that she herself has gone through one stage of transformation after another and another, and she takes us all along with her. So when she first spoke about what is it that brought her to even think about writing The New Jim Crow, it was that she herself had experienced learning the impact of having a felony. And it was when she learned about that, and she writes openly about it, she made a decision to commit herself to learn about and to change that system. And it was almost the force within herself of her own commitment and principles that has driven this process as far as it has. Then, about a year ago, she started thinking, well, maybe the Jim Crow system, the, the caste system that she so clearly defined, was a system, but then it's part of a broader system. And so she began to think about, well, what is that broader system? And then she started thinking about, well, there's all the issues that she had spoken about in her book, all the collateral consequences and the police misconduct and brutality and the racism. But then there's, you can work on each issue, but then what do you do when you've worked on each issue? What happens? How do you really make the change that relates? And I think that it's her own thinking, her own evolution, that's her own commitment in that evolution that's played a tremendous, it's been a tremendous force for our whole country. And I'm just really, really honored that she's here tonight to speak with us. Okay. Yeah, good evening to all you beautiful people out here. Yeah. Michelle Alexander, I tried to prepare some thoughts for when I came up here to introduce her tonight, and uh, I couldn't think of anything that I could say that would be original or something that nobody else knew. But after hearing the last speaker up here that just did 40-something years in prison, you know, the one thing, and he talked about leadership, the one thing I thought and I've arrived at as a result of my life experience is that this uh, question of leadership can only be addressed in one or two ways, man. It's either principle or it's unprincipled. It has nothing to do with age. It has nothing to do with color of skin. It has nothing to do with class. It has everything to do with principle. And how do I relate that to Michelle Alexander? When I read her book, the first time I picked it up, it was like reading my biography. Because everything she described in that book, I had lived. I was in the 32nd precinct at five years old on 135th Street. 
as a result of a, a misunderstanding in school. But I was sitting on the sergeant's desk with my feet hanging over, waiting for my mother to pick me up. And so my life has been steadily part of what every black man goes through in this country. You know, school to prison pipeline, the streets, incarceration, back and forth. Dropped out of every school I ever went to, but I ended up with four college degrees. You know, even attended Harvard. So when I read Michelle Alexander's book, it was like reading the, the New Testament. You know, I say, here it is. She's finally pulled all together. Here's somebody that finally pulled it all together. All the things that I've known all my life, I've experienced them. She pulled it together, and that book has become the New Testament of movement building out here. All we have to do now is connect dots. That's what we have to do. We have to stop speaking in a thousand voices, man. We gotta come together with one plan, one strategy, one set of tactics for bringing this, this system down. I'm an abolitionist. I'm not trying to tweak the system. And she isn't either. Thank you. So this is uh, a coming together, a collaboration between not only the Beyond the Bars conference, but also the Teachers College, Columbia University, Health Equity and Social Justice Conference. So in coming together and doing this joint introduction, it's my role to read the remarks that will give you some idea of how Michelle Alexander has arrived at this point in time. Michelle Alexander is a highly acclaimed civil rights lawyer, advocate, and legal scholar who currently holds a joint appointment at the Kerwin Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity and the Moritz College of Law at The Ohio State University. Prior to joining the Kerwin Institute, Alexander was an associate professor of law at Stanford Law School, where she directed the civil rights clinics. In 2005, she won a Soros Justice Fellowship, which supported the writing of her first book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Color Blindness. The book has received rave reviews and has been featured in many national radio and television media outlets. For several years, Alexander served as the director of the Racial Justice Project for the ACLU of Northern California, where she helped to lead a national campaign against racial profiling by law enforcement. While an associate at Saperstein, Goldstein, Demchak, and Baller, she specialized in plaintiff side cases, action, excuse me, plaintiff side class action lawsuits alleging race and gender discrimination. Alexander is a graduate of Stanford Law School and Vanderbilt University. Please join me in welcoming Michelle Alexander. Thank you for the incredibly warm welcome and the very kind introductions. Um, I am just thrilled to be here surrounded by so many folks who are dedicated to transformative justice. 
Um, this gathering is happening at such a critical moment in our nation's history. It's a time when it seems that many people all over the country, in small towns, big cities, from coast to coast, are beginning to wake up to the reality of race and justice in America. I think a time comes when the truth stares you in the face, daring you to look away and say nothing. But deep in your soul, you know that a breaking point has been reached and that if you avert your gaze or change the subject, you will betray not only yourself, your children, or your community, but all those who risk their lives so that black children would not have to be told that in the eyes of the law, their lives don't matter. That moment was reached when Michael Brown was gunned down and the young people of Ferguson stood up. It was not the brazen killing of a young unarmed black man by the police that forced an end to the silence. To the contrary, what happened that day was nothing new. Isabel Wilkerson, the author of The Warmth of Other Sons, acknowledged this in an essay published in The Guardian, pointing out that the rate of police killings of black Americans today is nearly the same as the rate of lynchings in the Jim Crow era. What happened that summer day when Officer Wilson killed Michael Brown was nothing new. But the young people in Ferguson had had enough. They were not going to allow the police to leave Michael Brown's body lying in the street for four hours while the authorities scrambled to get their story straight. These bold and courageous young folks took to the streets and in the weeks and the months that followed that they stayed in the streets, they scrawled on handmade signs three words eerily reminiscent of eras we supposedly left behind. Black Lives Matter. Now, I'm well aware that this particular crisis may feel new to many in this country, but its roots are as old as the country itself. We continue to live the paradox of a nation founded with the bold preamble that all men are created equal with certain inalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness while at the same time denying all of those basic civil and human rights to slaves and writing into our original constitution the rule that black people counted as only three-fifths of a human being. This paradox of a nation born with lofty ideals of equality and freedom but extending those ideals primarily to wealthy white men is the founding paradox of this nation and it remains a paradox to this day, even now as a black president sits in the Oval Office. Yes. We have inherited the glorious promise and the ugly paradox, and yet we too often close our eyes and refuse to acknowledge the painful implications. As I was thinking about what I was going to say tonight and getting my notes together, I kept getting messages from folks who are heading to Selma this weekend. Racial justice advocates, civil rights advocates from all over the country are heading to Selma, and I heard the President of the United States himself plans to make an appearance to commemorate the historic civil rights struggles and victories there. Now, at times like these, at these moments of commemoration, it's tempting to be romantic about the past struggles and overly rosy in our assessment of the present. But such revisionism does not serve the dream that Dr. King and Ella Baker and so many others risked their lives for. Now, none of this is to deny the extraordinary gains that have been made in some spheres. I mean, I would deny and dishonor the sacrifices of people like Ella Baker and many, many others if I didn't acknowledge that my own life has been drastically greatly improved because of their courage, their sacrifice, their advocacy. But if we're going to ask ourselves honestly as we commemorate Selma, how far have we come and where must we go from here, what is truly necessary as we work for justice in this new time, this new age, then I think we must first pause and ask ourselves, how do we measure progress? 
We could measure it in all kinds of ways. The number of people who are CEOs or leading Fortune 500 companies, the number of black or brown politicians or presidents, or the number of people with two-car garages and SUVs. We could measure our progress in purely materialistic terms. Do we have as much stuff as we think we should? Stuff like money, cars, degrees, titles. Measuring progress in this way seems to make sense in a capitalist society where the goal is to compete to get more stuff. There are winners and losers and everyone says they want to get ahead. Very rarely do we ask, get ahead of whom? And what will happen to them, those who are left behind? Well, I want to suggest that there is another way to measure progress, one that seems to have been forgotten in the years since Dr. King and Malcolm X were laid to rest. It's not a new measure by any means. To the contrary, it is very, very old. For centuries, it has been said by numerous philosophers and theologians that any society, any civilization, must be judged by how it treats its most vulnerable members and its prisoners. Yes. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. would surely agree with that assessment. Jesus himself said, what you do unto the least of these, my brethren, you do unto me. And so when I stand here tonight and consider how we in America fare when judged by this measure, how we treat our most vulnerable members and our prisoners, I cannot help but think of the millions of poor people, overwhelmingly poor folks of color, who are cycling in and out of our criminal justice system today, in this era of mass incarceration, in this post-King, post-Civil Rights era, a time when our prison population has more than quintupled and millions of people are now permanently locked up or locked out, stripped of the very civil and human rights that Dr. King and so many others risked their lives for and some even died for. It is a time when a black man, a father, can be choked to death by the police, begging for his life on video for the crime of selling untaxed cigarettes, and a grand jury comprised of men and women, fellow American citizens, could say no crime had occurred at all. Snuffing out the life of a black man over so petty an offense is no crime at all. It is a time when our collective answer to the violence that persists on the streets of Chicago, New Orleans, Detroit, and beyond has been more violence. That's been our answer. For we must never forget that imprisonment itself is a form of violence. It is legalized, state-sponsored violence. But it is violence, nonetheless, to take a person out of his home or off the street at gunpoint, even if you have a badge, and force them into a cage. And it is difficult to imagine that Dr. King would have believed that in communities ravaged by poverty, hopelessness, and despair, that the answer would simply be more violence, that we could punish and threaten our way to peaceful communities, to a place of justice. Today, a prison industrial complex, a prison system run for profit, a system of mass incarceration has been born. It is a system unprecedented in world history. And it is one that is so violent, so brutal, so unrelenting in its punitiveness that many Americans can scarcely believe the truth about this system when confronted with the facts. And for poor people and people of color, this system extends far beyond the prison walls into the streets of Ferguson and New York City and Chicago and to rural Louisiana and beyond. Once this system targets you, sets its sights on you, it's nearly impossible to escape its grip, its constant surveillance and control. The whites only signs have come down, but new signs have gone up. Notices placed in job applications, rental agreements, loan applications, welfare forms, school applications, and petitions for licenses. New signs have gone up informing the public that the millions of people branded felons and criminals in this era, this era of mass incarceration, are not wanted here. Discrimination is now perfectly legal against them. 
The lynch mobs may be long gone, but the threat of police violence is ever present. A wrong move or sudden gesture could mean massive retaliation by the police. A wallet can be mistaken for a gun. It is a system that has arisen out of the ashes of slavery and Jim Crow, a system that has branded tens of millions of people in this country as felons, shamed and scorned, relegated to a permanent second-class status. It is a system that rests on the premise that some lives simply don't matter. So if we're serious, and we're going to ask the question, how much progress has our nation made in achieving the dream that inspired the Civil Rights Act, the dream that fed the courage of those who marched in Selma, then I think we've got to ask ourselves whether we continue to create and maintain systems and structures that guarantee the exclusion, suffering, and oppression of others. If we're going to measure progress, we need to look not up to the top of the pyramid, to Barack Obama for evidence of progress, but down and ask ourselves, how do we as a society treat the most vulnerable as well as our prisoners? Not how the relative few, the rich or famous are doing. And when we ask ourselves that question, an uncomfortable reality begins to emerge. We must confront an inconvenient truth, the truth that we in America have done it again. We have rebirthed a caste-like system in this country, a new Jim Crow. Now, I must confess that I'm very tempted right now to give you all a new Jim Crow lecture, an overview of the war on drugs and the war on crime and how it all actually works as opposed to how it's advertised and how these wars, and more importantly, the war mentality, us versus them, search and destroy, lock them up and throw away the key has decimated communities of color and how our legal system has conspired to keep millions of people cycling in and out of prison for the rest of their lives. For I know that many people in this audience may think they know how the system works, just like I once did, but really don't. Some of you may think you have some idea of how bad it is, how discriminatory, how brutal, how the system is rigged, but you don't really know the half of it, just like I once thought I knew but didn't. So if you don't really know the role the drug war has played in quintupling our nation's prison system, if you don't know that whites are just as likely to use and sell drugs as people of color, if you don't know all about the financial incentives that have been given to state and local law enforcement, millions of dollars paid rewarding law enforcement agencies for the sheer numbers of drug arrests, and if you're confused and think that maybe the various wars that have been declared on poor communities of color the war on crime and the war on drugs have been focused on rooting out violent offenders or drug kingpins. And if you don't know that the overwhelming majority of people arrested and swept into the system have been arrested for relatively minor crimes, and if you don't get that this system operates practically from cradle to grave, targeting young people at very young ages, often before they're old enough to vote, stopping, frisking, searching them, when all they may be doing is heading home with some Skittles in their pocket. Well, then please read my book. <laughs> yeah. And if you don't know that the current system of mass incarceration can be traced back to segregationists who once chanted segregation forever and then changed their tune with the passage of the Civil Rights Acts and began chanting law and order and built a get tough movement, a movement designed by pollsters and political strategists who found that thinly veiled promises to get tough on them, a group not so subtly defined by a race, could be enormously successful in appealing to poor and working class whites. If you don't know about the Southern strategy, if you don't know about racial code language, and the use of welfare and crime as a means to break the Democratic Party in the South and build a new Republican majority. And if you don't know about how this backlash emerged at precisely the same moment that work was vanishing, disappearing from inner city communities due to deindustrialization and globalization, leading to waves of joblessness and the economic collapse of inner city communities and rising crime, creating the perfect storm. Or if you're operating under some delusion that the Democrats have been the better angels, that they have been kinder or gentler 
in this era of mass incarceration if you don't know that it was President Bill Clinton who mastered the game of using subtle racial appeals, and that it was his administration, a Democratic administration, that escalated the drug war far beyond what his Republican predecessors even dreamed possible. If you don't know how the U.S. Supreme Court eviscerated Fourth Amendment rights and immunized the system from judicial scrutiny for racial bias, if you don't know this history, if you have some trouble connecting the dots between slavery, Jim Crow, and mass incarceration, then please educate yourself. I wrote my book in the hopes that it would be a tool, but there are many, many other good tools, excellent books and resources. Read Angela Davis's book, Are Prisons Obsolete? Read Douglas Blackman's book, Slavery by Another Name. Read Paul Butler's book, Let's Get Free. Read Christian Parenti's book, Lockdown America. Read Prison Profiteers, Who Makes Money Off of Mass Incarceration. Read Brian Stevenson's book, Just Mercy. And if you're an academic, you'll especially appreciate the data and analysis in Bruce Western's book, Punishment and Inequality, outstanding book. Read Marie Gottschalk's book, Caught, The Prison State and the Lockdown of American Politics. I mean, I could spend all night describing the problem and telling you what to read, to learn about it, and the many different valid and competing perspectives that have been offered. But in the short time I have here tonight, I don't want to spend all my time describing the problem and telling you what to do to learn all about it. I want to take this time to challenge us, to wrestle with the question of what is required of us as people who are dedicated to racial and social justice at this moment in our history, 50 years after Selma, what now in our struggle for justice in this era of mass incarceration? And I must say that in reflecting on this question, I find that I have little patience now for the politics and business as usual. I no longer believe that this system will die a death of a thousand little cuts, a little reform here, a little reform there. I no longer believe it. For what we've seen is that systems of racial and social control adapt too easily to minor reforms and in fact have the capacity to be reborn in new form, tailored to the needs and constraints of the time. What we face today is not a problem of failed public policy. For the system actually works very well, precisely as it has been desi designed. Now what we face is a crisis of conscience. And those who argue that advocacy challenging mass incarceration can be successful without overturning the utterly immoral public consensus that gave rise to it and sustains it are engaging in fanciful thinking, a form of denial. Yes, isolated victories can be won, even a string of victories, but in the absence of a fundamental shift in public consciousness, this system as a whole will remain intact. To the extent victories are won without a shift, the system will rebound. It will adapt. It will emerge in new form, just as convict leasing replaced slavery, or it will be reborn, just as mass incarceration replaced Jim Crow. Now, we do not have to look any further for evidence of the adaptability of this system in the history of New York City. Marijuana was decriminalized in this great city in the 1970s. The city was way ahead of its time. Possession of a small quantity of marijuana became a civil offense like a speeding ticket. But there was a loophole. There's always a loophole. If marijuana is in public view, well, then it's still a crime, a misdemeanor warranting arrest. And the police found in New York City that even after marijuana was decriminalized, not only could they continue to arrest poor black and brown folks, but they could ratchet up the rate of arrests by many, many fold. Between the years 2002 and 2012, the NYPD spent 1 million hours making 440,000 marijuana possession arrests, overwhelmingly of young black and brown men. How? by telling him, empty your pockets, what you got on you. The practice continues to this day as the editorial board of the New York Times recently reported, quote, Mr. de Blasio's team has produced contrived numbers in an unpersuasive attempt to prove that the arrest picture is somewhat improved. 
But there's no hiding the fact that New York City is still administering unfair police practices that disproportionately penalize communities of color and damage the lives of overwhelmingly young people who are targeted. Public anger around this issue will continue to grow until Mr. de Blasio changes the very ugly status quo, end quote. The striking racial disparity can be seen by the contrasting Upper East Side, which has one of the lowest marijuana arrest rates in the city with its neighbor directly to the Northeast Harlem. The arrest rate for marijuana possession in East Harlem is 110 times higher than the Upper East Side even though we all know and studies have confirmed for decades that people of color are no more likely to use or sell illegal drugs than whites. Over and over we've seen that the same mentality and belief systems resurface and continue to operate, exploiting whatever loopholes are available or manifesting themselves in new structural arrangements. So what does this mean for us as we reflect on doing the work of transformative justice? Well, after years of walking the path of piecemeal policy reform and tinkering with the machine, working as a civil rights lawyer and advocate, I now finally understand exactly what Dr. King meant when he said just months before his death, after Selma, after the Civil Rights Acts and voting rights had been passed, he told a reporter, quote, for years I labored with the idea of reforming the existing institutions of the society, a little change here, a little change there. Now I feel quite differently. I think you've got to have a reconstruction of the entire society, a revolution of values, end quote. Yes. Frustrated by white resistance to addressing in any meaningful way decaying ghettos, failing schools, structural joblessness, and crippling poverty, Dr. King said that America must be reborn. He said, quote, the dispossessed of this nation, the poor, both white and Negro, live in a cruelly unjust society. They must organize a revolution against that injustice, not against the lives of their fellow citizens, but against the structures through which society is refusing to lift the load of poverty, end quote. And when speaking to a staff at the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in 1967, staff who were concerned that the civil rights movement had lost its steam and direction, King said the time had come to shift from a civil rights movement to a human rights movement. Political reform efforts were no longer adequate to the task at hand, he said, quote, for the past 12 years, we have been in a reform movement. But after Selma and the voting rights bill, we moved into a new era, which must be an era of revolution. We must see the great distinction between a reform movement and a revolutionary movement. We are called upon to raise basic questions about the whole society, end quote. Well, today I fear that many civil rights lawyers and advocates like myself have been stuck in a model of advocacy that King was determined to leave behind. Rather than challenging the basic structure of society and doing the hard work of movement building on behalf of poor people of all colors, we have been tempted too often by the opportunity of people of color to be included in the political and economic structure as is. And we have allowed ourselves to be willfully blind to the emergence of a new caste system, a system of social excommunication that has denied millions of poor people and people of color basic human dignity. The significance of this cannot be overstated for the failure to acknowledge the humanity and dignity of all persons has lurked at the root of every caste system. This common thread explains why in the 1780s, the British Society for the Abolition of Slavery adopted as its official seal a woodcut of a kneeling slave above a banner that read, Am I not a man and a brother? That symbol was followed more than a hundred years later by signs worn around the necks of black sanitation workers during the Poor People's Campaign, answering the slave's question with the simple statement, I am a man. And yet here we are, decades later, and a black man in the White House and most Americans claiming to be colorblind, and thousands of people are holding signs reminding a forgetful nation that black lives matter. The fact that sign is necessary today in protest of yet another caste system suggests that the model of advocacy that has been employed for the past several decades is not, as King predicted, adequate to the task at hand. If we can agree, that what is needed now at this critical juncture is not mere tinkering or tokenism, 
But as King himself insisted more than 40 years ago, a radical restructuring of our society, then perhaps we can also agree that a radical restructuring of our approach to advocacy is in order as well. Of course, there are those who tell me that my newfound revolutionary spirit is misplaced, especially now that there is so much progress being made through traditional political channels to end mass incarceration in America. I'm often asked, aren't I thrilled by marijuana legalization? Aren't I delighted that the Koch brothers and Newt Gingrich are sitting down at the same table with the ACLU in the center of American progress to come up with a grand plan to end mass incarceration? Aren't I glad that President Obama granted clemency to eight people convicted of nonviolent drug offenses? Isn't it great that the Justice Department just issued a report finding a pattern of practice of race discrimination in the Ferguson Police Department? Aren't I delighted that the new mayor of New York City finally settled the stop and frisk case? Over and over I'm asked, did you ever think back when you were first writing your book that any of this would be possible? And I have to confess that Yes. Yes, I definitely thought this was possible. In many ways, it is exactly what I feared. As a nation, we are on the verge of doing many of the right things for the wrong reasons. Now, don't get me wrong. I am a supporter of marijuana legalization. In fact, I believe that the possession of all drugs for personal use should be decriminalized. I believe, yes. I believe we should follow the example set by Portugal, which more than a decade ago decriminalized the simple possession of all drugs and saw rates of drug addiction and drug abuse fall as that nation stopped caging people caught with drugs and started investing in drug treatment on demand. Yes. And I am glad that there is emerging bipartisan support for reducing mandatory minimum sentences for some nonviolent crimes. And I'm happy about reforms that will make it more likely that people struggling with mental illness will have a chance of getting meaningful treatment rather than a jail cell. Yes. But when considering whether marijuana legalization and the recent bipartisan initiatives represent genuine progress, and by that I mean truly transformational change, I think we should ask ourselves, have we as a nation changed our minds about the dignity and value of the people whose lives have been destroyed by the drug war? Or have we simply changed our minds about marijuana? If legalization is motivated primarily by our changing views about the drug, the growing consensus in the metal community that marijuana is actually less harmful than alcohol or tobacco, but our views about them, those who've been targeted for these drug crimes, hasn't really changed, then we haven't made much progress at all from a racial justice perspective. Similarly, if we've got to ask ourselves, is the primary engine driving the new bipartisan enthusiasm for criminal justice reform driven primarily by a new awakening to the value of the lives and communities that have been destroyed? Or is this new enthusiasm for reform driven primarily by concerns about the costs of this massive prison state and reluctance to raise taxes on the predominantly white middle class? Truly transformative change will come when and only when we change rules, laws, policies, and practices because we have opened our hearts and changed our minds for the better regarding the dignity and value of all people, of all colors, no matter who they are, where they came from, or what they may have done. By doing the right thing for the wrong reasons, we save lives today only to lose them tomorrow. For what we know, what we certainly ought to know by now, is that these systems of racial and social control adapt and morph over time, adapting to the needs and constraints of the time. Ultimately, what lies at the core of the current caste-like system is a flawed public consensus, a failure to care, really care across lines of race and class, the belief that some lives simply don't matter. And it is this failure to care that lies at the core of every caste system that has ever existed in the United States or anywhere else in the world. So I rejoice for the lives that may be spared by these new bipartisan alliances, but I am filled with grief 
for those we will certainly lose tomorrow if we do not find a way to steer this ship in a radically different direction and develop a new moral consensus. Yes. And yes, I am glad that Mayor, Mayor de Blasio stopped fighting the litigation brought by the Center for Constitutional Rights, challenging the city's discriminatory abuse of stop and frisk practices, and that he responded to the overwhelming pressure brought to bear by grassroots organizing going on right here in New York City. Yes, we made him. But I have to pause and take a deep breath as I consider how far he and we have truly come. For even as de Blasio has rightly entered into a landmark consent decree and spoken the truth about his sons dealing with the police, he has practically in the same breath clung to and reaffirmed the cruel and immoral doctrine known as broken windows policing. Yes. And for those who may be unfamiliar, broken windows policing is the notion that the best way to make our communities safe and secure is to come down with a hammer on people who commit the most minor of infractions. Not on all people, of course, for broken windows policing is not practiced with any great enthusiasm in wealthy neighborhoods, but only on the poorest and most vulnerable communities of color. This notion that to deal effectively with them, those people, the others, we must arrest and fine and cite people in mass for things like selling untaxed cigarettes, riding a bicycle on the sidewalk, jaywalking, or playing your music too loud. This zero tolerance, purely punitive mentality and impulse, believing this is how you make a community safe. This is how you keep them under control. This belief system lies at the root of all that is wrong with so much of our politics and our justice system today. Perhaps you've heard the old saying, when all you've got is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. And when it comes to poor communities, particularly communities of color, all we bring is the hammer. Everyone in those communities is viewed and treated as nails, nails to be pounded down into submission, beat down so you can barely see their heads anymore. The statistics cited in the DOJ's report on Ferguson, but the grossly disproportionate rates of Black folks, folks of color being cited for minor infractions in Ferguson. You can find those same statistics right here in New York City. You need to look no further than New York City. Now, I will not deny that broken windows are a sign of distress in the community if they become a regular occurrence, just like trash in the streets or lots of hostile graffiti on the walls. When plentiful, those are signs. And I'll be the first to admit that ignoring those signs of distress comes at a price, a price that is paid first and foremost by the people who live there. The critical question is, how do we respond to those signs? Do we bring the hammer? Do we not have other tools at our disposal? And if we do, and I know we do, what sort of crime do we commit by failing to use them? And please do not believe it when people say, oh, these are only misdemeanor offenses, so no big deal, no need to be too concerned about what's going on there. For after all, it was just a minor misdemeanor offense that Eric Garner was accused of when a police officer saw fit to choke him to death for his crime. Now, of course, that's an extreme case, but the point remains. If you know anything at all about how this system works, you know that if you're poor, you likely can't pay that misdemeanor fine. And you might lose your job because of all the time you have to take off standing around waiting in court. And these misdemeanor offenses, they too can follow you for life in this age of technology. And they too can be the reason you're denied employment or housing. And suddenly this little misdemeanor offense is the reason you're unemployed or homeless. And now this little misdemeanor is being used against you in a sentencing hearing. Because you robbed a convenience store or sold some weed because you were hungry or desperate for cash. And then the judge looks at you and says the words, repeat offender. And the prosecutor says, yeah, he's nothing but a troublemaker. He's had numerous run-ins with the law. So yes, it matters. It really matters when we show up in the lives of poor people with nothing but a hammer. Like I said, I believe that we now find ourselves at a fork in the road. We can continue down the road most traveled, the road of business and politics as usual, the path of reforming our political institutions, 
A little reform here, a little reform there. The path that Dr. King was determined to leave behind. Or we can choose a different path, the rocky, dangerous path that comes without a map. If we choose this path, there will be no guidebook, no instructions. All we will have is our moral compass and the whisperings of our ancestors in our ears, reminding us to dig for deeper truth and to speak and to act with greater courage. The courage to prove that we are truly in solidarity with the least of these, those who have been despised, those who have been labeled, those who have been cast out, locked up, locked out. Proving that solidarity means being willing to speak unpopular, difficult truths, never avoiding the racial dimensions or the profound moral questions for purposes of expediency. It means never seeking justice on the cheap, but always demanding full restoration and reparations for those who have been harmed the most. It means being on fire for justice and believing with undying faith that the slaves who sung songs of freedom in the cotton fields and the immigrants who are toiling in the fields today and those who risked their lives on freedom rides or who marched in Selma and those who faced tear gas in Ferguson and all those who march carrying signs saying black lives matter and I can't breathe right here on the streets of New York City were not foolish to dream that America can be born again. We can and we must build a movement to end not only mass incarceration and mass deportation but a broad-based radical human rights movement that ends once and for all our nation's history and cycle of creating caste-like systems in America. A movement for education, not incarceration, jobs, not jails. A movement to end all legal forms of discrimination against people released from prison. Discrimination that denies them basic human rights to work, shelter, to food. A movement for voting rights for all, including those behind bars including those behind bars. A movement that will end the drug war once and for all and shift to a public health model for dealing with drug abuse and drug addiction. A movement that will stand up to the police unions and transform the police itself from warriors into peace officers directly accountable to the communities they serve. A movement that will ensure that every dollar saved from ending the wars that have been declared on poor communities, the wars on crime and the wars on drugs, will be invested back into the communities that have been harmed most. Justice reinvestment and reparations. A movement that abandons our purely punitive approach to dealing with violence and violent crime and embraces a more restorative and rehabilitative approach, one that takes seriously the interests of the victim, the offender, and the community as a whole. A movement that is rooted in the awareness of the dignity and humanity of all of us, no matter who we are, where we came from, or what we may have done. I hope and pray that this year, 2015, will be the year that King's Revolution was finally born, the nonviolent revolution he prayed for and died for, Finally, the sleeping giant woke up, got up, and walked, and chose the road less traveled. And that, I believe historians one day will say, ultimately made all the difference. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. Thank you. You've got to take in just any innovation. As you can see, there's absolutely no way that we could be exposed to this without giving her an award. So please remain for just 50 seconds. The seventh annual Health Disparities Conference at Teachers College Community University, the Health Equity and Social Justice Conference honors Michelle Alexander. <laughs> Nationally, Renowned legal scholar and author of the acclaimed best-selling book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness, for outstanding service 
as an advocate for social justice and restoration of the rights, dignity, and humanity of the incarcerated in the United States, and for leadership in contributing to a 21st century movement for equity and social justice for all. Can we make some noise one more time for Michelle Alexander? Did she bring it or did she bring it? Did she bring it? Impact Theater is about to come back and bless us one last time. But first, I want to acknowledge, we're about to bring the young folks up to bless us, to close us out, set us off properly. I want to acknowledge Governor Jim McGreevy of New Jersey. Give it up for him in the building, all right? Thank you for being here. And Commissioner of Health of New York City, Mary Bassett, please show us some love for coming out. The, thank you all, give yourselves a round of applause for being here, for being such a powerful, inspiring audience. And one last time, to send us home, to get us home safe, with a lot of love and to continue this work in the movement, please put your hands together for impact. Come follow me, you wanna be a SRR the double E. The flame but either way, I know who I am. Like who to can't take my name. Ain't told you to call me Vin Rain. Mr. Man, give us a free lesson, K.I. Take my freedom, read him and we been I Take my freedom, six feet deep. Learn how to read while you were sleeping. Wrote a note to your white man, so it was cheating. While I was bleeding, hands tied to a tree. We both were breathing, but the tree was speaking. Teaching me to hold on tight to freedom. First freedom the mind, then the body believing. When you're free, your brain's from chains. Platinum on the lead, it's like a roast from the dead. It's like a roast from bed. It's like you hungry the bed. Still starving, Marvin, it's only I want to be free. What we made to be locked in by the slavery. I wanna, I wanna be, be free. So free, and free to be. I got no chance to hold you. Oh, I wanna be free. I wanna be free. Free, free. Got rappers in the world don't know what they living for. Passing opportunities and even open doors to freedom. The only thing that I'm living for. I'm young, I'm smart, and I want more. Rappers in the world don't want to be free Cause they tied to their lives and opportunities Pass by, don't know what they do with these Gifts that they had like you and me I hear what they saying, confusing me When they talk love, drugs, community I once was blind but now I see We remain in chains but I want to be free No line, I'm spying till I'm lying in the ground I'm a non the spider so just gather around Uh, I ain't a rapper, I'm a truth, hand me down I hand out the truth where the truth can't be found be Not yet what we're made to be Locked in modern slavery I wanna be free. So free and bold to be. I got no chains holding me. Oh, I wanna be free. Oh, never yeah. be. Living life to the fullest cause I wanna, I wanna be. be I wanna be. I wanna be. I wanna be. Get your soldiers on the street. Get off the floor. Get your feet. Come follow me. You wanna be the F, the R, the double E. Get your soldiers on the street. Get off the floor. Get on your feet. Come follow me. I want to be free to be what I see in the mirror feed. See these sixes coming, they look and they feel you. Still living in slavery. No freedom and it shouldn't be. I want to be free without being told. It's a possibility. It's no joke how to pass it is. This got me reminiscing. Wish we could put a stop to this. Listen, Listen MC. That's what I love to do. A simple educate your minds with the truth. Got a history mental. That's what I do. I hold it down. Like, like I'm supposed to. Step to the mic, step on stage. Get it, free, get it. People feel it, realize they've been hypnotized. Trick by the skies, aka the evil eye. Knowing the truth, laws confused. If when I know who to run to when faced with troubles, let like freedom ring. Cause now is the time, cause the games is time for a change. Who's never I wanna, wanna be free? Not yet, what we made to be locked in by the slavery. I wanna, I wanna be free. So free, he wants to be. I got no chance holding me. I wanna be free. Not a slave to a brain, I'm gonna be. Living life to the fullest, cause I wanna, I wanna be, be free. free. I wanna be free. I wanna be free. I wanna be free. I wanna be free. Not yet, what we made to be locked in by the slavery.
slippery. I want to be free. So free him to be. I got no chance holding oh, me. I want to be free. Not a slave to a grave. Oh, Never yeah. gonna be. Living life to the fullest. Cause I want to be free. I want to be free. I want to be free. Free. Get free, y'all. Get your hands up high. A freedom worth living is a freedom worth dying. Get free, y'all. Get your hands up high. A freedom worth living is a freedom worth dying. Get free, y'all. Get your hands up high. A freedom worth living is a freedom worth dying. Get free, y'all. Get your hands up high. A freedom worth living ain't free. I got to get. I got to get. I got to get. I got to get. I got to get free. One more time for Impact Repertory Theater. Please give it up for Kathy Boudin, Geraldine Downey. No, no, we got, we got to do that. We not, no doubt, no doubt, no doubt. The Center for Justice at Columbia University. Please give it up. Y'all have a wonderful night. My name is Breon Bain. Peace.